Okay, hello, we have Dr. Katie Woolley today and I will gladly introduce her. She is a holistic veterinarian and founder of The Natural Pet Doctor. Dr. Woolley is incredible, passionate about ensuring pet parents have holistic medicine as an option, regardless of where you live, which is awesome because we are from Guatemala. <laughs> Dr. Woolley had her own battle with her pet as her fur baby B, uh, was battling cancer. Now she's on a mission to make sure she can do whatever she can to help all other pet parents and their fur babies live a long and vibrant life. So woo, that is awesome. Thank you so much for making the time for us. How are yeah, you? Thanks. Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me um, and just sharing, sharing what I do and helping more pet parents and even veterinarians, especially in Guatemala. Yeah, thank you. I, I One of the special things I wanted to say is that you do make a lot of complex information really easy to understand for us as pet parents. So thank you so much for that. And I'm also drinking tea since you're the, <laughs> the tea doctor. Oh, that's so funny. Honor. Oh, I love it. I I just literally was talking to my community about having a tea drinking session. So I absolutely love that you mentioned that. <laughs> And we just saw you giving that advice in Inside Scoops. So oh. that's why. <laughs> oh, I love that you were both there. Fantastic. Yeah. My chamomile tea is my go-to for anything. <laughs> awesome. So we would like to start uh, asking you, how did you get into this in integrative approach uh, for the wellness of, of pets? Yeah. So my journey, it started about 10 years ago. Um, I've been a vet for a little bit longer than that, but it actually started on the human side. Um, my wonderful husband, about six months after we moved back to the States, I actually went to vet school in New Zealand and lived and worked there for a few years after vet school. And my husband's from there originally. So we eventually came back about two years after I finished vet school. And six months after that, he developed an autoimmune disease. So he developed IBD and got major gut health issues. And through that whole process, um, I realized that there has to be a better way. We were told by numerous gastroenterologists, GI doctor specialists, that there was nothing else we could do other than strong immunosuppressives. And they didn't really work very well. And they could come with really serious side effects like death. And so I decided that that's ridiculous. And I started researching and went down the rabbit hole like so many pet parents do um, with their pets and found this whole other world of medicine. And that's when I became acupuncture certified, Chinese herbal medicine certified, uh, use essential oils, food therapy, all those things, because I realized I was essentially telling my clients on the pet side that there was nothing else they could do when conventional medicine ran out. And I wasn't okay with that um, because I felt how it felt on the human side with my husband. And now, you know, so a couple of years after that, I realized I just absolutely love the holistic side. So I started my own business about five years ago, the natural pet doctor. And I focused solely on the holistic side, of course, taking my knowledge from conventional and integrating it because we still need conventional medicine. Um, but especially for so many of these pets with chronic health problems and cancer and GI issues and allergies, Conventional medicine is not fixing the problem and we have to fix the root issue. And that's where the power of integrating in a holistic approach truly is. So it kind of like it would never wish autoimmune disease on anyone, but it actually turned into a blessing in disguise of being able to shape my career and my veterinary path. And it helped us find a different way to really approach health and medicine in general. Yeah, that's also similar to my story. I started changing my diet first and then my pet's uh, diet. Uh, okay, so um, what kind of chronic disease do you attend uh, for your clients? Like, uh, could, we, could we use like this kind of approach into all disease or is it just a specific ones? Yeah, so I end up usually seeing pets at the end of the road, right? Uh, where they've been told numerous times there's nothing else you can do. They're usually really sick when we when they see me. 
However, there's really like a proactive approach and a framework that I follow, and we can apply it to sick pets, or we can use it for healthy pets. And it's something that I call like our five pillars. And this is where essentially using like nutrition and gut health is a pillar, looking at the physical health. So this is also going to include like, you know, exercise, it's going to include the lymphatic system. So detoxification, it includes the immune system emotional health, we're included in that pillar to our own emotional health. And then of course, environmental health. So all the toxins and how do we support detoxification? Because I find a lot of times, especially when pet parents are new on like the journey, or they're realizing like there's a different way, we tend to focus so much only on food. And food is a pillar. And it is very, very important, right? Food is medicine. Hippocrates had it right. And, you know, all disease begins in the gut but it's connected to everything else. And so I like to always say like, we don't wanna miss the forest for the trees by focusing on one symptom and we miss all the connections that are occurring elsewhere in the body that have potentially led to the symptom we're seeing that led to the us like calling it cancer or that disease. So I like to take a whole body approach and really dial in and look at all of these areas because we don't want to miss the emotional health component. A lot of times these pets are toxic. They have heavy metals and they're not detoxifying properly. So we need to make sure that those pathways are all open. We need to make sure the microbiome's working well, that we're digesting. So we're actually absorbing nutrients. We need to make sure we're environment, like enrichment of the environment. Um, we're not overtaxing the immune system. So that's how I approach every single pet is by simply following that framework and those pillars and then adjusting it and adapting it to that individual pet and their like personal circumstances. That's that's really amazing because like you said, many, well, I, I was one of them. Uh, we tend to take the symptom as the enemy and we don't understand that that's the a way that the body communicates that there is a problem and that problem has a root cause so that's mm. really amazing and we really admire the way you talk about a uh, gut health and uh, we know that that's like your core message for all the pet parents so i would like to ask something a uh, more specific and that's how, uh, in your experience, what uh, impact does the, the, the digestive health and nutrition have on cancer prevention, uh, for example, that, that's a disease that many of us uh, tend to um, fear a lot with our pets? So can, if you can tell us something about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, personally, I've had three pets that have passed from cancer. So it is very near and dear to my heart. And here's the thing. I always say we're on like a spectrum, right? We're either here's disease, here's health, and we're constantly moving along it. And this is where nutrition can play a huge part because the nutrition that we put into our pet's body is either going to be the safest form of medicine or it's going to be the slowest form of essentially poison, right? And so this is where if we're feeding a food that's highly processed or, you know, essentially like kibble, this is where we're going to potentially have a harder time reducing inflammation and optimizing the body. Now, I understand like some people like that's the only option we have sometimes. And there's ways to improve the food like a kibble or a processed diet by adding in food toppers and fresh food. So hopefully people are eating some fresh food and they can set aside some food for their pets. Um, eggs are a great example. Uh, things like just even meat, fresh meat, you know, blueberries, cucumbers, like those are all great options that we can add into our pets like food bowl if we do have to feed that. So I don't want anyone to think like, well, I'm doomed, right? You're not doomed. There's a lot of great things you can do if you can't feed like a less processed diet. Now, on the other side, if we can get to a less processed diet, this is going to look like things like your freeze dried your dehydrated diets, uh, lightly cooked foods and raw foods, whether it's pre-made or you're making it yourself, 
What's beautiful about those types of foods is that we're using fresh food. So it's more easily digestible. So what that means is the body breaks it down and we can absorb it better. And your pets are able to utilize those nutrients that are in the food. So compared to like synthetic vitamins and minerals that are in like a kibble diet or a dry food diet, those are a lot harder for the body to absorb because they're synthetic. They're not natural. So when we look at nutrition, we want foods that are going to be easy to be broken down that aren't putting a lot of stress and potentially creating a lot of inflammation um, or oxidative stress is what we call that um, on the body. And so those fresh food diets are going to be easier. Now, the thing is, though, as I see it all the time, we can feed the most beautiful, well-balanced diets. But if our pets aren't optimized to break down that food, they're not digesting it and absorbing it. So it can be really frustrating. You're putting all this energy, time, and you know, a lot of times money into a really high quality food. And you're like, why is my pet still having diarrhea or you know, getting cancer or things like that? And this is where I always look at, okay, you know, what's going on in the stomach? Do we need to add something like digestive enzymes, especially with older dogs as they age? They naturally reduce the amount of digestive enzymes that they're making. So it makes it harder for them to break down the food. That's what digestive enzymes do. We have lipase, we have, you know, your proteases, we have um, all sorts of different types of digestive enzymes that are working on different parts of the foods from the proteins to the fats, to the carbohydrates, if you're feeding carbs, um, and we need that. And so we need to make sure that we're supporting those. And then Two, we have the amazing microbiome. And this is where there's trillions of different types of microorganisms that make up this microbiome that lives in your pet's GI tract. And we're hopefully have a nice, happy ecosystem where everyone's happy, they're playing together, they're working together. But a lot of pets, unfortunately, because they're coming across toxins, they might've had antibiotics in their life for whatever reason, those can actually take out or wipe out the microbiome. And that reduces the amount of good bacteria and also the diversity. So the number of different types of bacteria that we have. Now, the reason why this is bad is because they're doing a lot in the body. They're producing vitamin or they're helping with vitamin production. They're breaking down the food. So to help absorb vitamins and minerals, they're producing hormones uh, like vitamin D, <clears throat> different neurotransmitters. We know that serotonin, 90% of that is produced in the gut. And so this is where we have to look to the gut whenever we see a symptom or a disease like cancer, because a lot of times the answer lies in the gut. There's something off. And so whether it's a behavior issue or a change or itchiness or allergies or diarrhea or cancer, um, any type we, anytime we have an illness, we have to go back to the gut because a lot of times that microbiome's off and then digestion might be off and we need to support that better. So we're actually reducing inflammation and absorbing and digesting the food properly. So the gut is huge. There's a lot going on. It's not just about like food in, food out, right? Just looking at the stool. I see pets that have microbiome issues and have normal stool. So we still, we need to be thinking about those things, especially when we start seeing symptoms or chronic health issues like cancer. Wow. Yeah. I can count with my hand. I think that the pets that we know that haven't been able to uh, be introduced antibiotics or pills for diarrhea, like it's so common or even steroids well, for a lot of pets that have itchy skin and so on like I don't know maybe two pets that we know haven't had any kind of antibiotic but it's hard to then try to give a, a cooked food and to see how they respond and also that the pet parent is a, a bit scared and and you know just trying to okay this is okay and it will take a while but mm -hmm. we can do it um but yeah, and what other things do you start with the microbiome? Because we actually don't have, you know, tests like animal biome or anything, or even that would be a lot more expensive than provide fresh food. So how would you start with an environment like ours that we don't have all kinds of tools? Yes. 
And I think this is a good point, right? You know, over here in the States, right? The animal biome, microbiome testing, all these new functional medicine tests are great. But I want pet parents to remember, we haven't always had these tests. And so, and we've healed guts not having these tests. So testing is helpful. It's very helpful, right? Because it gives us an idea of what's going on so we can specifically treat it. The number one thing I would say for someone who doesn't have access or is able to do the testing is what can we do to better optimize the food? This is where I would rather people put their money, to be honest, versus all the different types of supplements that are out there, especially if you are feeding a kibble diet. Is there a way that we can figure out a, a way to like create like a lightly cooked diet or a raw food diet? That's going to be key. And this is where going to, um, I'm not sure if it would be um, the same way, but if you can go to like your local butcher or partner with a farmer and get the things that they're getting rid of, right? Like the organs, um, see, like a lot of times they're disposing of those things. And our pets, it's like they're vitamins and minerals that we can use to make their, their diets. So if we can source that, you know, from a source that we know, like, and trust, and we're supporting also local, which is fantastic, right? Everyone wins. And creating homemade raw diets, once you start doing it and you get the hang of it, it becomes really easy. You know, I think it's that overall fear at the start that stops so many pet parents from doing it, but it's actually pretty easy. Um, so it's just a matter of getting into a routine and getting a system set up and, you know, whether you're following like an 80, 10, 10 ratio, and then we're adding in certain things like an omega-3, you know, other, there's a lot of great free resources. We have one on our website too, that people can download. Um, but there's a lot of great other uh, websites out there that provide tons of free information. Perfectly Rawsome is one of like my go-to that I just absolutely love. Um, free information. She teaches you how to like balance the diets for both dogs and cats. Um, so check out those resources and then start sourcing. Because here's the thing. If we have a microbiome issue, for one, we need variety of food. We need fresh food so we can reduce inflammation in the gut. And then we can also, use, and we need a balanced diet too over the long term. Every meal doesn't have to be balanced. And I find a lot of pet parents get really stressed about that. Like if you think about us, like I've never met a single human yet, yeah, maybe I'm wrong, but a single human who balances every single meal perfectly and they've done it every meal for their entire life. It just doesn't happen. So it's okay. Like I want people to like know it's okay that every meal may not be perfectly balanced, but if we're introducing different types of meats and proteins and different types of organs and, you know, following certain ratios, if you choose that type of diet to set up, you're mo more than likely going to be fine and it's going to help your pet more than you can create harm doing that. That's key. And then, you know, this is where too, looking at that diet and looking at your pet as an individual, where are the gaps in the holes? So if we have a healthy pet, but they're aging and they're a senior, this is where we want to add in more like omega-3 essential fatty acids, whether we're adding a fish oil supplement or if you're able to add in whole like fresh fish, great. Sardines, great. Um, if you're able to fish for that, fantastic. Like, you know, utilizing your resources and your environment. Also, to, I'm pretty sure it's really easy to grow things there, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. I see. I love it. it. I live in Colorado. I'm like, I'm in a desert. Like, I love gardening. I used to live in New Zealand and I could put something in the ground and it would grow. Not in Colorado. This is also where you can grow like herbs and other plants and vegetables, and you know how you grew it. Um, so you know it wasn't contaminated by like pesticides or insecticides or things like that. Um, so if you can grow some of your own like leafy greens, um, that will be really helpful too. We want some roughage. We want some phytonutrients. Those are the nutrients from the plant that are more concentrated. The other neat thing about those vegetables is that a lot of times these plants are acting as what we call a prebiotic. This is a food source for the beneficial bacteria. So remember I talked about the microbiome Now, all these trillions of microorganisms. If they don't have fiber in the diet, they actually die. 
So we want to make sure we're including fiber in the diet for both dogs and cats. So that way we can feed and help those microorganisms grow and flourish. And that's how we can use fresh food. So you don't necessarily need like the probiotics with the prebiotic supplements and all that, you know, the inulin and all of that. You can use things like medicinal mushrooms. So medicinal yeah. mushrooms, not the psychedelic mushrooms, the medicinal <laughs> mushrooms. So like button mushrooms are a super easy source. Um, you want to lightly cook those just to help break it down. It makes it easier to digest. We can also use things if you can get asparagus or grow asparagus. That's a great prebiotic and it has a lot of vitamins and minerals and nutrients in it. We can also use things like if you can get chicory root or grow chicory root. Um, those That's a great natural source of fiber. So we can use fresh food kind of like how we use our supplements. And they're actually probably going to be better than the supplements themselves because it's in whole food form. And when we use something in whole form, this is the whole concept of herbalism is we're using the, the whole thing. We're going to get all the synergistic properties working together and it's going to be doing more than one thing in the body. So this is also where I'd be using herbs too, right? Um, so certain herbs like adding in some basil is really helpful. Um, adding in, if you have a dog that has a lot of heat in their body, we can add cooling herbs like peppermint or others in the mint family, like spearmint. And those things grow like wild, right? If you plant something in the ground. So we can add a little bit of this as like a topper to the meals to help balance it and assess our pets from like an energetic perspective and use the power of like food therapy and the energy to, to really tap into the power of like food as medicine. Okay. Yeah. We can grow almost anything here. That's the good I figured. thing. I love it. <laughs> and uh, since we're already talking about fresh food, uh, maybe in a nutshell, like why, if I want to prevent any disease for my pets, why will fresh food be better than kibble? Yes. Okay. In a short time. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. We this is a big talk. <laughs> uh, so I highly recommend every person to research like the pet and pet food industry, like understand the history of how it came to be made. Um, now, keeping in mind, I know there was a recent documentary released on the History Channel here um, that didn't really showcase the whole story. Um, so whenever you watch something, you always want to ask the questions like, get both sides of the story. But pet food wasn't developed to help pets. It was actually developed for financial reasons. They saw it as a business opportunity. Because when we think about what were pets doing, this is a newer industry. Like this began back in 1950. Like it hasn't been around very long. And so how were these pets surviving, would you ask, right? Before the pet food industry came along, how were they not just like dropping dead on the streets from nutritional deficiencies? Well, we had dogs scavenging, they were eating like table scraps, right? And so many pet parents are told not to feed table scraps, right? Because it's harmful. But this is how like dogs were surviving and thriving at that time. And cats were a lot of times outdoor hunting, scavenging, they're eating like prey, mice, rats, rodents, rabbits, right? So they're getting everything in that food, right? So essentially it developed because there was a electrician that was watching uh, sailors come in and feed dried biscuits to dogs on the wharf. And he was like, huh, they really like that. And he's like, I bet you I could create a business opportunity. And that's essentially in short order how it started. It wasn't started by a veterinarian. There were no veterinarians involved in actually formulating these diets until much further down the road. And then, then it was still being overseen by these bigger com companies like Mars, which sells candy also and a lot of other things. And so when we start looking at why are they creating food? And is this for the best interest of my pet? I would have to question the, the actual like logistics of that, right? Um, so the problem here is though, is how is pet food made? So that's the backstory of how it came to be. The problem is, is how like kibble is made. And kibble is an extruded product. So what that means is that for one, in order to make a kibble, it has to be over typically 50% carbohydrates for it to even be formed into a pellet. So it's a really high carbohydrate food. 
Now our dogs and our cats have zero requirements physiologically for carbohydrates. That means they don't actually need them. Now I'm not against adding carbs. I just talked about like plant matter and things like that. We're using that for the fiber content, the extra phytonutrients to feed the microbiome and support the cells. They technically don't physically need it though, but in order to make kibble, we have to have it. So they've taken ingredients like corn and wheat and other carbs that are pretty cheap, right? Keep the costs low. And it goes through a machine that essentially cooks this kibble mixture, this mash, at really high heat temperatures multiple times. And then it pops out a kibble, which essentially tastes not very good. It's like I'm probably eating cardboard. I've never tried it and I will never try it because I'm afraid of it now. After knowing all the things, I don't want it in my mouth. <laughs> um, so, but then they spray fats and rendered fats on it. Now, I didn't even talk about rendering, but there's there's a lot of things that go into this. The ingredients that are being used are not human grade ingredients most of the time. Unless it says it's a human, like human grade, it's a feed grade. Feed grade has different definitions for its types of food it's allowed to use than a human food, which is crazy. And most people and even my colleagues don't even know that. So the problem is, is that we're using meats that aren't suitable for human consumption. So these are going to be like your 40 meats, your dead, diseased, dying, and disabled. Um, so roadkill, where does it go? It goes to the rendering facility. So that way it can be cooked down into this like gruel. They skim off the fat. That's what's sprayed on the kibble to make it tastier. I hope no one's eating while they're listening to this because it's absolutely disgusting, right? Um, but the problem, we're not using high quality ingredients. And then the other issue is, is when we're through that extrusion process, when we're cooking it and heating it at really high heat temperatures, we're getting things like advanced glycation end products. Um, we're getting malleard reactions that are actually creating these byproducts that produce a lot of oxidative stress, which leads to inflammation in the body. It also impacts the microbiome. And there's a lot of research out there now that shows that these pets that are on a high carb diet actually have higher levels of inflammation. And so I always think about, I want people to think about like, if you take a piece of meat, like a sausage or, you know, a hot dog and you cook it on the grill and you overcook it, like you burn the heck out of it. And it's got like the char grill around it, the black stuff that's carcinogenic, right? We scrape that off and you're like, oh, that's no good. We don't want to, we don't want to eat that. This is exactly what's being formed in your pet's kibble through the way they make kibble. It's actually carcinogenic. And the problem here is, is, and you may be asking, well, nothing bad has happened, right? To my pet up to this point, I've been feeding this food. They seem fine. The thing is, is that remember we're on a spectrum and we're either moving towards health or we're moving towards disease. And most of the time we don't see any symptoms when we're on here when we're moving on the spectrum. So if you think about if we're eating a meal that's really inflammatory, so think about yourself, if you were to eat a fast food meal, right? Something super unhealthy, you're moving closer to disease. You may not feel anything, but if you keep eating that every single meal for the rest of your life, like we feed our pets, eventually the body's gonna go, I can't handle this anymore, and it breaks. So it's like a bucket with water and the water starts overflowing. And that's when we see the symptoms. Those are the check engine lights. There's something major that's been going on even before that process happens. So just because we don't see something right away doesn't mean that something bad isn't occurring. There's things we can do though, like we talked about with adding and changing over to fresh foods or using fresh food toppers that will help. But this is where just because you're not seeing a change right away doesn't mean that there won't be something down the road. This is what happened to me and my pets. And that's the thing. I've been there. It's happened to me. I see it with my clients. And I don't want people to make that mistake because it's a false assumption to think that just because we don't see something bad happen immediately, that something bad isn't occurring internally that could lead to essentially like a train wreck down the road. Wow. And that's where the this preventative approach uh, takes place. And 
with that, I, I wanted to ask you, besides improving the food with natural foods, um, how else can we as pet parents decrease that toxic load uh, in our pets? Because as you said, it's not only about the food, but a whole other bunch of things around our pet. Yes. So I'm going to touch on a couple of things. They're actually fresh food because we're trying to think of ways like people can grow things because you just live like you're lucky where you live, to be honest, like being able to grow things um, goes back to my pillars, right? What other areas can we support? And the detoxification, we are going to come into contact with toxins, no matter what we do, how hard we try. A lot of us are already born with them, but it's going to happen. We know like glyphosate or Roundup, it's in 90% of rainwater. So we want to be making sure that we're supporting those detox pathways. That includes the liver, that includes the kidneys, that includes the gut, that includes the skin, the lungs. They're all supporting detox. Main three though, liver, kidneys, gut. You, burdock root, amazing, super gentle. So you could actually get burdock root if you can um, and just shave it. You can like um, just uh, like a cheese grater, right? Like you can just shave a little bit onto the top of the food um, and that's going to help support. And then dandelion leaves, dandelion. I mean, it's a weed. It shouldn't be a weed. Most weeds are actually <laughs> like therapeutic, right? They're medicinal, um, but dandelions are amazing. So this is where you can get, dan if you're grow I would grow it, you know, it's great for the bees, um, you know, and then you can take the leaves and you can finely chop it. And that's like your green source in the food, but it's also supporting those detox pathways. So those are a couple of easy foods that you can add in, but we need to be supporting those pathways. The other thing too, if you, if something's going on with your pet or you're worried that there was like, I don't know how much spraying goes on in Guatemala with like pesticides or things like if you live near a farm or something like that and they're spraying or you know that there's a like a heavy burden or um, if just if there's a worry or a concern or a higher risk I'm a big fan of what we call binders so this is supporting phase three of detoxification this is the gut so if the liver is doing its job and it clears the toxins out and they go into the gut if the gut's not able to like get it out or there's leaky gut or inflammation, those toxins can get recirculated back into the liver, back into the bloodstream or get restored, which doesn't help anyone, right? So we can use what are called binders. The most simple, easiest binder is activated charcoal. Is that easy for you guys to get down there? Yeah. Okay, I figured like it's the one of the easiest, it's usually really cheap too, which is nice. What I like about binders, especially activated charcoal, it's a broad spe spectrum binder. So it binds a lot of different things. So it's going to bind those toxins, grab them, hold on to them in the gut, and it gets it out of the body so it doesn't get recirculated. So the big thing with using binders or activated charcoal, you want to use it away from the time of like your meals or if there's other meds or supplements. Um, because it'll bind to those two. So I typically say a binder at the end, like before bedtime is perfect. So two hours away from the main meal, just give some activated charcoal, especially in times of like, okay, this, I know someone was spraying or there was a, like a toxic burden, give that binder and it'll help your pet clear those toxins. Now it can make the stool look black. Don't worry. That's completely normal. It should go back to normal, but you can use that binder as needed. So if you live in a really toxic area, this is where I recommend using it more frequently, um, making sure to keep it away from the food so we're not binding to vitamins and minerals and causing issues. Um, and then if you live in a really like clean environment, less toxic, this is where you can use it for kind of routine prevention, like once a month. Or if you have to give like heartworm medication, like preventatives, um, that's when you would use this to help bind the toxins um, around that time when you have to give something. So I find detox is commonly missed and it's really, really important for helping the body and supporting health, but also supporting when a pet's going through like a health condition too. Yeah, yeah. We use a lot of milk thistle for yes. pets that already... I have uh, their liver enzymes 
you know a little bit off <laughs> and yep. yeah we have a lot of uh, dogs also with renal uh, disease already so yeah uh, yes i would add here's the other things i would add with milk thistle um this is where adding in like extra taurine can be really beneficial too um, because taurine a lot of time is being used up faster it's really important for phase two of the detox pathway. Um, so there's phase one and phase two. We won't go too in depth. It's that could be a whole nother talk that I love talking about <laughs> uh, in the liver. And there's different vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that we need for those pathways to work. Um, so things like milk thistle works on phase two. Burdock also helps um, your vitamin E, magnesium. Um, all these vitamins and minerals are going to be working on different pathways. Your, uh, your broccoli, your cruciferous vegetables, foods that are high in sulforaphane also help support those pathways too. So this is where if you do like sprouts and you make sprouts like broccoli sprouts or, you know, other types of radish sprouts, those are going to work on those pathways and they're going to also support detox. So if a pet has high liver values, incorporating all those different herbs together and then using a binder will help them clear out the toxins and kind of give that liver less pressure. It's not working as hard to, um, you know, of course, figuring out like why is the liver like upset is really, really important. But these are things that are really safe that pet parents can do to help bring those values down while you're trying to figure out why the liver values are elevated. Yeah, and then the last step will be getting out of the body. So all of the toxins and we definitely love fiber. Actually, yep. I don't think that we have any case of, um, you know, a prey model without any vegetable like we love vegetables here good perfect so. i'm super happy about that i think the prey prey model raw like it's a starting place but it needs things added to it is really really important and a big part of the things that are lacking that we see now in studies and a lot of the microbiome testing is the fiber component um, we need to feed fiber um, the microbiome is essential to life and it's commonly the reason why we get stuck and we keep going in circles, right? Not getting anywhere is because one simple thing, adding in fiber can mm -hmm. change the world for a pet. And it's simple. And as you said, it's here is very cheap. It's the cheapest part for us uh, to get. So, uh, and, and we have in the whole country, the whole country can get their veggies no matter what time of the year it is. So. Perfect. Yes, we're very blessed with that. Yes. And so with the final question, we also wanted to, uh, well, what advice would you give to the veterinarians here in Guatemala about this holistic approach uh, to health? Yeah, great question. Uh, so this is where, you know, I look back at where I was. I always, you know, I been through a lot the journey the journey's had its ups and downs lots of learning lots of different certifications and things and education right but I look back to where I was because that's where a lot of vets are with the knowledge we're gaining from vet school and I think the biggest thing that I would say to a veterinarian is I would love for people to start asking why more so why does this pet have diarrhea versus what do I give it um, and that creates a whole different conversation. Um, and also too, it makes you expand your knowledge base because I found for myself, when I was just giving things like metronidazole or a steroid, you get stuck in this rhythm, but then you have the pets coming back over and over again for the same problem. And you're frustrated, your client is frustrated, like the pet's not improving. Whereas if you take a step back and you go, well, why is this happening? And you start figuring out like, oh, okay, let's look at the food. What's going on with the food? Okay, was there a toxin that was given? Maybe it's this flea and tick preventative that this pet's reacting to. You can actually figure out what's going on and then it becomes easier for the next pet because a lot of things are repeatable. And so if, if veterinarians start asking why, that will help change and help them better address the root cause. So why am I using metronidazole? Is there an alternative to this? 
And that's where there's so many different things that they can tap into. And also too, there's so much information online also. Continue to learn and educate yourself and don't just assume that like everything we learned in vet school is all we ever need to know. If I had done that, I wouldn't be a vet anymore. To be honest, I was not happy as a vet. Like it was not fun. It's not fun to tell people there's nothing else you can do and to see sick pets all day long. Not fun. What I do now is much more fun because I get to see, even though I see a lot of really sick pets, we actually change that and we give them hope again. And there's a lot of great, easy, natural things that we can do. Even just like a simple thing like the fiber or activated charcoal for diarrhea can work better than metronidazole and it doesn't create health problems down the road. So I think just asking those better questions and continuing to learn um, and educate yourself, I'd say, number one, learn more about how to help your clients create a fresh food diet would be key because you can grow so many things, you can access fresh foods. And if we can start changing that, they're going to have a lot more healthy pets that they're treating and their jobs will be so much more fulfilling and satisfying. Thank you. Great, right, yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you. And um, do you actually attend right now clients uh, from outside the United States? Is that a possibility? <laughs> yeah. So we have a couple of different ways we work with people. I'm a little bit different. I think that's just the theme <laughs> So of my entire career in life, to be honest. However, we have a, a program that we've been running for a couple of years now, and it's our blueprint program. And we have clients from all over the world. So we have some people in Ecuador, some people in Mexico, uh, Singapore, Dubai, like all over, which is I absolutely love. And what we essentially do is we teach them how to apply the five pillars that you heard me just briefly mention. And then we have a community that's not on social media. It's a very safe community where you can ask questions and I'm the one that answers them. And then we also do weekly Q and A's. It's an application only program because it, I just need to make sure it's the right fit for what you're looking for. So anyone, we have, you know, health practitioners that are a part of it. We have pet parents, essentially people who want to learn more, help their pets and cover root imbalances, and then also get support. It's a lifetime program. Um, so they can definitely apply for that. They can go to the naturalpetdoctor.com um, or they can send an email to info at the naturalpetdoctor.com. We also, I just opened up a better gut health program that's self-paced. Um, it would actually be suitable for a veterinarian too. Um, so I wanted to create um, essentially a lower, like lower price point program that teaches people how to go through um, and figure out the root imbalances and then use the frameworks and tools that I use and recommend. So it's definitely, I would say a mid to advanced level like education um, type program. Um, but we also have other programs also. One of the neat things that we do for pet parents all over is we do hair tissue mineral analysis tests too. I'm not sure if you've heard me talk a bit about it, but they're really neat because it's not like blood. Like blood is the highway of vitamins, minerals, hormones, nutrients, right? It's taking it somewhere. But the tissue is where the cells are, where things are being manufactured, where the energy is being made. And so with a hair tissue mineral analysis test, we can actually get a snapshot of the past three months of what's been going on at a cellular health level in the body. And because it's fur, it doesn't degrade. And yeah. anyone in the world can send a fur sample to us and we send it to the lab. Um, it also looks at heavy metals. So we get an idea of like how toxic is the pet how well are they detoxifying? And then it also looks at like stress levels. So we look at the different like calcium, magnesium, sodium, copper, different vitamins, minerals, and nutrients. And then the different ratios can actually indicate like, are the adrenals stressed? Are the other systems stressed? Are we stuck in a fight or flight response? Like that sympathetic nervous system state. And from that information, I create a report for pet parents. It's usually about eight to 10 pages long. There's recommendations wow. for food and supplements. And it just depends on where you're at in the world. I work with a lot of people overseas. So I'm used to, you know, finding supplements that work for them that they're able to access. Um, but that's another really cool tool that I use that gives me so much information on what's going on internally um, that 
pet parents have access to. So anyone in Guatemala can run it. Vets yeah. can run it through us if they want. Um, but it's just another tool in the toolbox to help us uncover what's really going on. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing. I, I, I really want to try it. <laughs> yes. It's really, it's amazing. I've, I've done them on myself and my husband too, because you can do them for people and it's, it's really mind blowing to be honest. It's, it's incredible. It, it, removes the guessing game, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it just makes things easier to know you're on the right path with what you're doing. And it can be done as a proactive test too. You don't need to be sick to do it. Mm -hmm. You can get an idea of the balance in the body. Um, so you can see, is the food I'm feeding being digested, absorbed? Is it providing the nutrients? Is it support? Do I need to support detox more? Um, so it just, it, it gives you definitely a good idea and then the plan moving forward yeah we'll Great. definitely <laughs> take a look at that for sure uh okay thank you so much for your time one last thing can you say adios guatemala which means bye guatemala <laughs> yes i know a little bit of spanish oh, yeah? So. yeah yeah <laughs> adios guatemala <laughs> thank, oh, you. thank you you're awesome yeah thank yes. you so much for having me